My name is James Jordan. I'm a member of the class of 1993, and I am the senior manager for regional and diversity outreach at the Stanford Alumni Association. Welcome back to campus and to this very special occasion. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 18th annual Multicultural Alumni Hall of Fame ceremony. <laughs> It is my pleasure to introduce Howard Wolf, a member of the class of 1980, and Vice President for Alumni Affairs, and President of the Stanford Alumni Association, who will bring us greetings. I'm pleased to present to you Howard Wolf. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you so much for coming. On behalf of the Asian American Activity Center, the Black Community Services Center, El Centro Chicano, and the Native American Cultural Center and the Stanford Alumni Association, I join James in welcoming you to this 18th annual Multicultural Alumni Hall of Fame induction ceremony. We have 435 events over the course of our reunion homecoming weekend, um, but this is always a highlight, and it's the highlight because of what we hear about these wonderful inductees. During every reunion homecoming, this occasion is always a great opportunity to recognize the contributions of Stanford's finest and most distinguished alumni from the Asian American, African American, Chicano Latino, and Native American communities. The Multicultural Alumni Hall of Fame was established in 1995 to recognize alumni of color who have distinguished themselves through exceptional advancement and success in education or career and or outstanding contributions to our community and society as a whole. As someone who has attended this event for the last 11 years, the accomplishments are truly legend. Each year, the inductees selected from each community center comprise the members of the Multicultural Alumni Hall of Fame. Before the program, during our reception, the names and photos of the members of the Hall of Fame were displayed on the screen to my left. These inductees represent what we have come to expect, what is best about Stanford. Though they have all various backgrounds, career paths, and contributions, what binds them together is that they are all a part of this very special place we call Stanford. Their experiences on the farm, their experiences on the farm in different ways contributed to their development and to the people they are today. I know that by hearing their stories and celebrating their successes, they will inspire all of us to strive to be better alumni, students, faculty, staff, whatever you may be, and be better global citizens. To our alumni and guests assembled here, I'm thrilled to welcome you back to Stanford, back to the farm, back to this very special place between the foothills and the bay where the Stanford spirit was born in all of us. I hope that you have a great time reconnecting with old friends and making new ones as well. To our guests of honor, Please accept my sincerest congratulations on this very important honor. We are proud that each of you is a part of our Stanford community. Thank you so much, and I'll hand this back over to James. Thanks, Howard. Each of our four inductees is here with us this afternoon. They will be presented by the, community, the director of their respective community center. Because of we have limited time and want to ensure that everyone has ample time for their remarks, I would like to remind the directors and the inductees <laughs> to be mindful of the time so that everyone will have a, an opportunity to speak. We need to be particularly mindful as we are audio and videotaping the ceremony for download on Stanford iTunes. Um, I will be paying attention to the clock and appreciate everyone's cooperation to ensure that we finish in a timely manner. With that being said, let's begin the celebration. Our first inductee is Lauren Kiva. He is a member of the class of 1969. He will be presented by Karen Beesman, Associate Dean and Director of the Native American Cultural Center. Thank you, James. I just first want to assure you that even though three of our four distinguished inductees tonight are lawyers, there was no conspiracy of the bar. Um, we did not talk to each other in advance, but we do have incredibly talented attorneys with us. 
in honor of Lauren. The late Lakota theologian and legal scholar Vine Deloria posits that Western law is premised upon constructs of rights, whereas tribal justice models are built upon responsibilities. And in tribal worldviews, there is no separation between the realms of justice, culture, service, and knowledge. They are integral cogs in the cycle of the whole. Lauren Kiva has demonstrated uncompromising vision and leadership in parallel realms, promoting both the legal rights and interests of his myriad of clients in a distinguished career where he is recognized as a super lawyer with superior ratings for highest ethical standards and for leading the profession and bar as a trustee and reformer. In fact, 22 past, present, or future chairs of the litigation section of the American Bar Association commend Lauren for his important roles in, quote, improving both the law and the practice of law, advancing the legal profession and advancing the interests of equal justice for all, including the underprivileged and underrepresented in our society. As a pioneering legal advocate and scholar, he has led the bar in civil justice reform, worked to reduce the tragedy of gun violence, promoted nonpartisan voter protection, and co-founded the Judicial Intern Opportunity Program, which places minority and disadvantaged law students in summer judicial internships, among other initiatives too voluminous to include here. At the same time, Lauren has demonstrably impacted Native communities, Native culture, and intellectualism through his deep service commitment to the arts and the academy. Robert Ames, who joins us today, one of his nominators and also a fellow Stanford Law School alumnus and an inductee himself, served with Lauren as board leaders of the Institute of American Indian and Alaska Native Culture and Arts in Santa Fe as well as of Stanford Associates, and heralds his contributions richly. Lauren's leadership was transformative at AIAA, resulting even in lean fiscal and challenging institutional times in growth and real progress. And Stanford Associates Awards Committee, too, flourished under his leadership. Lauren's zealous support of interdisciplinary education is further evidenced by he and his wife, Anne's, and joins us as well this morning, or this afternoon, generous endowment of a distinguished lecture series in Stanford's Center for the Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity, where he is also a founding board member on the National Advisory Board. Some may call Lauren a Renaissance man for his mastery of so many disciplines, but I see him as a living model of excellence in both Western and tribal worlds, whose contributions are testament to the richness of multiple traditions. As Dr. Margaret Anderson, chair of the CCSRE National Advisory Board writes, I am often amazed at his capacity for hard work, his dedication to community service, and his passion for making our society more inclusive and welcoming to people regardless of their social and economic background. He is a gentleman and an inspiring leader. Congratulations, Lauren. If you would come up here, we also have a, something else for you. We also honor Lauren with this Pendleton wool blanket a tradition we share with Native graduates here at Stanford, but maybe not back in the late 1960s. <laughs> so it may be a little late coming, we apologize. Note the color red is symbolic. In Cherokee tradition, which is uh, Lauren's uh, ancestry, it is associated with success and triumph, which so aptly complements his life's work. But at Stanford, we like red for a host of other reasons <laughs> as well, so we thought you would too. <laughs> I would like to take it off for my remarks, would if I like could, please. <laughs> <laughs> a 
Osio, Yaate, Ola, Nihao, Konichiwa, Habari. I am honored to join my friends and the people I admire Scott Mamade, Bob Ames, Rick West, Roger Clay, Maria Echeveste, Gordon Chang, and Hillary Tompkins in this group of Stanford alumni. It is sort of like being given an award for eating gelato. <laughs> I would like to thank Anne, my partner for the last 40 years in our great adventure, for her love and support. One of my most brilliant achievements was getting her to marry me. When you watch game shows on television, you're struck by the fact that everyone's spouse is either handsome or beautiful, and all their children are gorgeous and brilliant. We pride ourselves on having four children who, in the words of Garrison Keillor, are slightly above average. <laughs> we moved to San Francisco from Washington, D.C. 12 years ago. Getting closer and more connected to Stanford has been an enriching experience for both of us, particularly with our friends at the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and the Center for International Security and Cooperation, which, both of which do so much good for this world. I've had the privilege of attending great institutions of higher learning. At Stanford, I learned to open my eyes and ears to a new, open way of approaching learning, untrammeled by ivy walls and traditions. At Oxford, I learned the value of one-on-one -on -one interaction with a probing law don who challenged every word I wrote and every word I spoke, and a community of international scholars who did the same. I would like to bring you greetings and tell you about another educational institution that I suspect a fair number of you have never heard of and that has been a major part of Anne's and my lives for the last 18 years. The Institute of American Indian and Alaska Native Culture and Arts Development is one of 36 tribal colleges in the United States. Its short name is the Institute of American Indian Arts, or IAIA. The IAIA was established in 1962 on the campus of the Santa Fe Indian School as a separate high school under the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It had a bold and innovative approach to arts education that challenged Native American artists to think way outside of the box of traditional Native art. In 1975, the IAIA became a two-year college offering associate degrees in studio arts, creative writing, and museum studies. Because of my wife's Anne's and my longtime love of Native American art and our ties to Santa Fe, in 1994, President Clinton appointed me, and I was confirmed by the Senate as a trustee of the IAIA. I was then practicing law in Washington and New York, and this was like going to heaven. I got to go back to Santa Fe, where I grew up, and work to advance Native American art, education, and culture as an officer of the United States. When I joined the IAI board, I met Bob Ames, a fellow trustee, a wonderful colleague, and someone who has become a good friend. But all was not honey and roses, or even fry bread and beans. When I came on board, the IAI was housed in substandard space rented from what was then the College of Santa Fe. Some of our classes were taught in 50-year-old temporary corrugated tin structures called Quonset huts. But we had an annual appropriation of $9 million, a dedicated faculty, and some 450 eager students. And we had been given 140 acres of raw land five miles, five miles outside of town to build our own campus, and we had a $12 million quasi-endowment to do it with or at least to start it. I was sworn in in November 1994. That same month, there was a landslide election. The Gingrich Contract with America, 105th Congress, was sworn in in January 1995 with a mandate to reduce spending on social programs. The IA was both an educational institution and one for Native Americans, so it qualified as a twofer. The first budget Congress passed reduced IA's appropriation to $6 million. The next year, it reduced it to $4 million. To make sure we did not miss the message, the appropriation was accompanied by a statement that the following year, our appropriation would be zeroed out. I was then asked by my fellow board members to become chair of the board. <laughs> by that time, the IAI's president had resigned, and we found out later had sent out letters that IAI would close. As a result, we lost over half of our students. So what did the board do? Taking a deep breath, we took half of our $12 million quasi-endowment, $6 million, and said we would use it to continue to run the IAIA for the next three years. This required that we pair our curriculum to the bare core minimum. This also meant that we had to lay off a number of valuable faculty members. In the great American legal tradition, they sued us. We then took the other $6 million and did something that took considerable pluck or folly, depending upon how you view it. We used the $6 million and started construction of a bare-bones campus on the 140 acres of land we had been given. 
Our theory was, like a field of dreams, or really a reverse Alcatraz occupation, if we built it, they would have a hard time throwing us off the campus. We also hired the best Republican political advisor we could find and started walking the halls of Congress to convince the members of, and their staff of how important IAIA was to Native America and Native American art. Astounding or reckless, it seemed to work. In August 2000, IAIA moved its college down, down to under 2,000 students, excuse me, now down to 200 students to its permanent campus. We partially restored our congressional funding and obtained more funds from other public and private sources. We then raised the funding for several state-of-the-art buildings, including a library, an academic and administrative center, a resident center, family housing, a student life center, and a cultural learning center. In the fall of 2010, we added another 60,000 square feet of building space with a Center for Lifelong Education Conference Center and the like. And our congressional funding is now restored back to its previous levels. We are keeping our fingers crossed in the current round of congressional budget discussions. The IAIA will celebrate its 50th anniversary next week. If you come to Santa Fe, I invite you to visit our campus as well as our Museum of Contemporary Native Art in downtown Santa Fe. The lesson, I guess, as Margaret Mead has told us, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has, or perhaps just stubborn ones. We did not change the world, but we think that we have made it a little bit better for Native Americans, Native American art and culture, and our country as a whole. Margaret Mead has also told us that prayer does not use up artificial energy, doesn't burn up any fossil fuel, doesn't pollute, neither does song, neither does love, neither does the dance. In beauty I walk, with beauty before me I walk, with beauty behind me I walk, with beauty above me I walk, with beauty around me I walk, it has become beauty again. Thank you. Our second inductee is Juju Chang, who received her Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Communication in 1987. She is celebrating her 25th reunion this weekend. She will be presented by Cindy Ng, Associate Dean of Students and Director of the Asian American Activities Center. Good afternoon. It is my honor to present the one non-attorney inductee, but equally accomplished. Um, and I just want to start by saying that it was pure coincidence that Juju was selected both as the moderator for the President's Roundtable tomorrow and as our inductee. It was two separate processes, but she rose to the top in both, which is a true testament to her achievements and her career. Having immigrated to the U.S. from Seoul at the age of four, Juju's family was one of the first Korean-American families in the Bay Area. As is typical for many immigrant families, her parents worked hard to support the family, and we're fortunate to have them join us today. Growing up in Sunnyvale, Juju's early talents included becoming a nationally ranked swimmer. It was her swim coach who, unable to pronounce her name, gave her the nickname Juju. At Stanford, Juju discovered her talent lay not in engineering, but in the world of political science and policy. Before leaving Stanford, she knew she wanted to be a journalist. Starting as a desk assistant, she quickly rose to become an on-air reporter, a producer, a correspondent, and an anchor. When she joined the Good Mar Morning America show in 2009, she was the first Korean American to anchor a morning news show. Some in the Asian American community fondly describe her as the most preeminent and visible Asian American talking head. While it may be true that at the time networks were working to diversify, Juju's rise in the field was earned through hard work and talent. In the words of her husband, Neil Shapiro, who's also with us today, Juju paid her dues. She's done everything she can do from the entry level and touched all the bases all the way up. Her in-depth reporting has resulted in multiple awards, including three Emmy and two Gracie Awards. Whether the topic is women's health, bullying, or the struggle of a family dealing with gender transition, Juju goes beyond researching, interviewing, and simply filing reports. 
The gift that makes her story so compelling is her ability to connect and build relationships with the people she interviews. It is not a technical skill, it is a human skill, and it can't be learned in journalism school. When she covered the earthquake in Haiti, Juju met men, women, and especially children whose lives were never easy to begin with, but were now made even more challenging. She was so touched by their stories that she organized 60 ABC colleagues to join her in a charity triathlon. Team Juju raised nearly $70,000 for the children of Haiti. In addition to her work as a journalist, Juju is actively involved in building communities. She is a founding board member of the Korean American Community Foundation, an organization dedicated to transforming and empowering communities through philanthropy, volunteerism, and intercommunity bridge building. In an interview with the Coriam Journal, her message to those reading the article was, it's nice to be part of a tribe. I do think there's something lovely about having that sense of belonging. And because creating and providing a sense of belonging is central to the mission of our center, it is fitting that we honor Juju Chang today by inducting her into the Multicultural Alumni Hall of Fame. Crazy good introduction. Thank you so much, Cindy. Appreciate that. I want to um, take a moment to thank my family for being here. My husband, my three children, who flew all the way out from New York to be with me, and were complaining, of course, that they didn't want to come this afternoon, the little ones, but they're very happy to be here now. <laughs> and in a fit of good parenting, of course, I tried to bribe them with an iPad and a teddy bear, and they're all here. So. It was a success. And of course, my parents, who you'll hear about in my remarks a bit, um, who live in Los Altos still. I grew up in Sunnyvale. But thank you all for being here. And my two sisters. Um, I know all four of my siblings would be here if they had a chance. They've been so supportive and loving uh, throughout my entire life, much less my career. So um, thank you, Hikyang and Yanni, for being here. And thank you, Fardad, for being here and helping out. Um, I feel, weirdly, exactly the way I felt 25 years ago when I came to Stanford, which is I'm not worthy. <laughs> How did I get here? How did I get in and stand amongst these other fabulous people? Um, because I came here as that poor immigrant kid who grew up down the block in Sunnyvale. We moved here when I was five. Um, I went to kindergarten and thought I was shy, but what I really was was completely unable to speak English. We had just moved here. So I'm a sort of poster child for immersion, you know, bilingual, not bilingual education, but immersion because we just jumped in and learned English. Um, early on, I think watching my parents go through the immigrant struggle has left me with a lot of compassion um, for my fellow man, which I think has brought a lot of perspective in my storytelling. Um, I think the first inkling I had that I wanted to be a journalist was when the hostages were released. I was probably about 13. And I have this very clear memory of jumping on my 10-speed bike and riding around my neighborhood going block to block going, the hostages are free! The hostages are free! So there's just something about me that sort of wants to spread the news. But I was a teenager growing up in Silicon Valley, and so I knew that you know you were supposed to be like Hewlett or Packard or Steve Wozniak or Steve Jobs. You know, I grew up, and I tell these stories about the apricot orchards and the cherry orchards that are now advanced micro devices or Google or what have you. So I came here, and my parents were convinced that I should be an electronic engineering major. So of course I signed up for calculus and physics and everything else. And, you know, Cindy alluded to the fact that I decided not to be an engineer. Well, that decision was made for me when I scored 27 out of 100 on my first physics exam. <laughs> and I was taking a class with a professor who had, a, I believe, a Nobel Prize no joke in physics. And I was like, <laughs> and the kids next to me were like, <laughs> and I thought, I am completely outmatched. But at the same time, after having, like, existential thoughts on the lawn laying out, because that's what Stanford students do. It occurred to me that I was really enjoying my political science class. And because I enjoyed it, and because I thought it was so great, I ended up getting an A plus in freshman political science. And I won a political science prize when I was here. And I thought, you know what? This is leading me in a certain direction. And I'm here today because I'm so grateful to Stanford, because in so many different ways, 
it formed me, it pushed me, it exposed me to things that made my career open up in the way that it did. Um, you know, as a, as a member of a minority, we all look for role models, and I remember thinking, well, what am I going to do with a political science major? Okay, it's fun, I enjoy it, but what am I going to do? And my mom was like, you know, that Connie Chung, she talks a lot, and she likes it, and you talk a lot. And so I was like, you know, that's something. It speaks about role models. And years later, when Connie and I were both working at 2020, I told her this story, and I thought we were going to have like a sister moment, and she was like, Oh, Juju, if I had a nickel for everybody who told me that, I'd be really rich. <laughs> but I found a path, and I found it here at, a at, at Stanford, and I worked at the newspaper, and I was the news director at K KZSU. But before that, I was a DJ at KZSU. It was Juju and the Native, and we had, like, spinning records and stuff. But just to put a little bit of a journalism note in my time at KZSU, one of my friends there at the time was Daniel Pearl, who you'll recall went on to a, a distinguished career at the Wall Street Journal uh, only to be um, taken hostage and killed. Um, and so it is a, a reminder that what we do is important, uh, you know, sort of raising public awareness and following stories, holding people accountable. Journalism is something that, that I learned here on the campus of Stanford. I was a double major in political science and communication. I cannot tell you the number of times I called upon my training, but weirdly not necessarily in communication from the Russian class that I took when I, you know, Peter Jennings walked into the research office one day and he said, how many barrels of crude oil does Russia export to Ukraine? And I was like, I have no idea. But I called my professor here at Stanford and he told me where to look and then I figured out this was in the days before Google, of course. <laughs> and I also found inspiration from my English classes. I remember coming here as a public school student and being with kids who had had really frankly, much better high school experiences, and they had read Chaucer and, you know, Baudelaire, and I hadn't even heard of these authors, but when I took English here at Stanford, I felt exposed to great literature, and really, I remember reading Pride and Prejudice and blowing my mind, because I, it, it was taught so well, and it was so passionately explained to me, and it's something that I carry with me to this day. I still love English. I think I was sort of a closet English major. I was sort of 15 credits shy of an English major as well. And of course I ended up at ABC in part because I got an internship with a professor here at Stanford named Jeremy Cohen who knew someone who knew someone. And it got me a ground floor, you know, job as a gopher, getting coffee, making copies. And six months later I met my husband. So I have Stanford to thank for that in some weird way. And I've been at ABC News for 25 years, basically. And I've worked my way up in every job that's, that's available there. But I, in many ways, I am the poster child for liberal arts education. And it's something I've thought about a lot because I didn't major in engineering. I, I did what those disciplines that are soft are considered you know, here on campus, I'm sure, but the stories that I do that involve human behavior and psychology and addictions, the interdisciplinary nature of what I do, everything from medicine to history to you know, business to music, um, all of those stories that I do, I'm a generalist, and I think that storytellers are, and journalists are, and I think that it's a proud tradition that, that I'm especially proud to be a part of. I also think that here at the Multicultural Center it reminds me of a story that I did that actually went on to win an award, but it was about a professor here um, in neuroscience named Ben Barris. And it was about sort of, at the time, Larry Summers was president of Harvard and he was making a stink about, you know, women scientists and the dearth of women scientists. And Ben Barris was a male neuroscientist who had been born female. He had been born Barbara Barris, and he told these amazing stories about when he was a PhD candidate at Princeton. He gave you know, a lecture on glia cells, something that went right over my head, and then had a gender reorientation surgery, went back a couple years later, gave a very similar speech, and people were told, told him later, like, oh, yes, Ben Barris, his work is clearly far superior of his sister, Barbara. You know, the kind of unconscious stereotypes that we talk about. And I came to this campus, interviewed Ben, 
he talked about when he was getting a, a PhD, he went up uh, and presented, this was like back in the 60s, right, presented a paper that the professor was trying to stump everyone in the class. And she figured it out. She brought it to the front of the class, and the professor said, oh, no, you didn't do this. Your boyfriend helped you do this. And he said, I remember thinking back, I can't believe he accused me of cheating. But what he was really accusing her of saying is, you're a woman, you couldn't possibly have figured this out. And so it was the kind of quiet prejudices that we explored in this story. And because Ben is a scientist, it wasn't just anecdotal information that he passed on. He looked at uh, TAs and the way that they are assigned. He looked at lab space and the way they're assigned. And there are actually prejudicial ways in which female scientists are treated. They don't get the same number of grants. If you make the, the, the grants blind, suddenly you know, minority and female winners grow up. So there were, it was a, it's a really interesting exploration of something that is called stereotype threat, which Claude Steele, a professor here at Stanford, discusses. And he said, he ran these tests, if I can remember them correctly, where he took athletes. And he took back black athletes and white athletes. And he said to the black athletes, giving them the stereotype threat in advance, oh, this is a test that measures um, natural sports IQ, your natural raw talent. And the white athletes were told the same thing. And weirdly, it was like a putting challenge or something. And the black athletes would do really well. And the black, white athletes wouldn't do as well. And then when you flipped it around and you told the black athletes, oh, this measures your sports IQ intelligence, your, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so then the white athletes would overperform and the black athletes would underperform. And he, what he surmised was that they were suffering from what's called stereotype threat. It's the same thing if your boss says, if, if you think at work, oh, my boss doesn't like me, then you suffer from underperformance because you get stressed out in front of that person and you behave in a different way. And by exploring all of these issues, coming back here to Stanford to do, it was, a fascinating look at bias and prejudice in the way that it is in today's modern era because I think it's not the outright overt prejudice that we encounter. It's the subliminal stuff, the vaguely sexist things, the, you know, my, my, you know, the, the things that are sort of unconscious. And it's those explorations that journalism can do. And I appreciate that it was a story that I was able to do here at Stanford with the scholarship that continues to go on here. Um, I have continued to remain involved with Stanford in a variety of ways, um, most recently uh, with the Alumni Association in New York. I live in New York, obviously. And um, they hosted an event with two mayors, uh, Cory Booker and Julian Castro. And I remember at the beginning of the event, the three of us were introduced to the stage and they were like, look at this, you know, natural multiculturalism at work sprung from Stanford. And... And of course, I goaded them on, and they made a cardinal pact. Julian said, I'll run for Texas governor if you, Corey, run for governor of New Jersey. So the Stanford team heard it first. I want to just you know, sort of conclude by thanking you all for being here, thanking the Multicultural Center for uh, inducting me. I'm truly honored, and, and as I said at the very beginning, feel not at all worthy of it, but am thrilled and grateful. And, uh, and so pleased to be here with you today. Thank you so much. I should say one thing. I never thank my husband enough because the joke around here is, you know, it's really hard being married to a saint. Um, and so I mentioned him briefly at the top, but I just want you to know, Neil, that you, I just couldn't do any of it without you. And you are just such a great dad and such a great husband and, you know, all of that. <laughs> For those of you who've come to these many years know what I'm thinking right now. I'll just leave it like that. And remember my first comment. All right. Our third inductee is Michelle Alexander. She received her um, law degree from the Stanford Law School in 1992 and is celebrating her 20th reunion this weekend. She will be presented by Jan Barker Alexander, Associate Dean and Director of the Black Community Services Center.
Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. So James is like, Jan, you did not tell me you had three students, as I always try to put students uh, in the front of when we do our Hall of Fame. So I promise, James, I'm going to be quick. I've given them time limits. But I want to start out with our talking about our inductee, Michelle Alexander. Clearly, you can read the bio. Highly acclaimed civil rights lawyer, advocate, legal scholar. I had a student do a little more digging about Michelle because based on everything she's doing, I wanted to know who's her family? Like, where is she? Where does she come from? For most of you, and hopefully all of you know, that she's published this book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. Now, right now, the book has been re-released in paperback in early, early this year and has received national acclaim, as usual, New York Times bestseller list for 35 weeks. It's also hit number one on the Washington Post bestseller list. But she's not being honored for selling books. She's being honored for changing lives. So with that being said, I thought, who, where does she come from? And what I found out, our student found out, because Google, they can use Google now, Alexander is the daughter of Sandra Alexander formerly of Ashland, Oregon, and the late John Alexander, originally of Evanston, Illinois. Her mother was a senior vice president of the ComNet Marketing Group in Medford, Oregon, which solicits donations for nonprofit organizations. Her younger sister, Leslie Alexander, is a professor of African American Studies at The Ohio State University and is the author of African or American, Black Identity and Political Activism in New York City, 1784 to 1861. She's married to Carter Mitchell Stewart, senior associate at a law firm. And it did say, also as a, St as a Stanford alum, Carter's a Stanford alum, but what I found very interesting, it said, Carter serves as a US attorney in the Southern District of Ohio. He does not share Michelle Alexander's views about the criminal justice system. <laughs> and so I said to myself, I just when I thought about mom and sister, what is the dinner table like? when you all are getting together. But it also talked about how she is the mother of three young children. And she's doing all of this. And so I can only imagine as the husband, as the children, and after looking and trying to get in touch with you a few times and seeing four options. If you want to schedule me for this, choose this person. If you want to get books, schedule this person. So I know you're very busy. I want you and I want this audience to know the impact and the reason that you're doing it. And who can better let you know that than Stanford University students? So each of you come quickly before James grabs the mic for me. And we're going to start with Laurel Frazier, who is actually a Stanford legacy. Her mother is in the class of 76. My name is Laurel Frazier and I'm a senior majoring in political science and African and African American studies. I grew up in San Mateo, only 25 minutes away from the farm, and until college, I hadn't really had the opportunity to confront the realities of our flawed criminal justice system. After reading Ms. Alexander's book, I was able to do just that. The new Jim Crow forces America to address what we'd like to believe we left behind a system that strips certain citizens of their unalienable rights and a land of opportunity for some, but not for all. It was clear to me that we still have much to do before we can truly have liberty and equality for all in this country. As someone who was looking to pursue a career in civil rights law, it has definitely had a strong impact on my path. It was an enlightening work to read with an extremely important message for all champions of justice. Hello, I'm Milton Nakapu. I'm a senior majoring in political science and African and African American studies from the Kansas City, Missouri. Um, so two years ago, at the end of my sophomore year, I had the opportunity to hear Michelle Alexander speak and actually meet her as well about her new book, The New Jim Crow, which has really had a profound impact on my worldview and the conversations on race, criminal justice, and education in our society. Um, I, find my, I found myself compelled to not only read the book cover to cover, but to give it to anyone who would take it from me. So friends back home, friends here. Right now my grandpa back home actually is reading it. Um, 
since that day, my signed copy has exchanged hands with all these people, and the provocative argument was really a little too scary to accept at first. Like, even in your talk, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know about this. But in hindsight, it's really too critical to ignore. Um, in the last years, I've written a bunch of papers using your argument and your call to action. Um, when I was in Oxford, I did a comparative UK-US drug policy paper. Also looked at the comparative of criminal rights and civil rights in the Supreme Court. Um, and over my Stanford career, there's been a few moments, and hardly any books for that matter, that have really changed the paradigm of my thinking and the way I view the world. Uh, but your book, The New Jim Crow, is certainly one of those. So thank you. Hello. My name is Devin Lambert. I'm a senior economics and philosophy double major at Morehouse College here at Stanford on exchange for the autumn quarter. Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, played a pivotal role in the way that me and my peers think about the part that we all play in promoting justice and equality in a changing and modern society. This past year, I had a chance to serve as the chair of the New Student Orientation Committee at Morehouse College. And for obvious reasons, we added this literary work to our suggested readings for the freshmen. And I was able to attest firsthand to the profound effect that it had on the minds and hearts of our incoming cohort of Morehouse men. Especially considering that at Morehouse, we're hoping to move them towards becoming social change agents and global citizens. So for that reason, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the entire Morehouse College community. So to Michelle, to Carter, those countless hours that you've been spending, this is the impact of your work. A new generation of leaders, a new generation of scholars, a new generation of people who will push for social justice and equality. And in my closing, I've got some words from one of your former professors and administrators at the Stanford Law School. Michelle is just so incredible. I have many, many fond memories of her. She always had a sense of who she was and willing to raise issues regarding injustices, whether people wanted to hear it or not. But when she talked, we listened. I always knew she would fight for those who were not able to fight for themselves, that she would care for those who society has ignored, that she would keep fighting until she was heard and the wrongs were made right. As an associate dean at the law school, it's students like Michelle, Maya Harris, and others who made my experience there so wonderful. So to you, we say Michelle Alexander, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Come and get your award. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really very moved by that introduction, particularly the testimony from young people who have read my work and been impacted by it. Um, you know, I have to say that when I first started writing the book, many people told me I had lost my mind. Um, I was on tenure track and I was supposed to be writing reasonable things. And so when I told um, a few of my mentors and advisors that I wanted to write a book arguing that our criminal justice system functioned more like a system of racial and social control than a system of crime prevention or control, they shook their heads and said, well, maybe you can wait till after tenure to say something like that. And when I persisted and felt really called to this work, um, I found more and more people getting nervous um, with the message that I wanted to share. And I understand that unease. As I indicated in the introduction to my book, there was a time when I rejected the very claims that I make in my work. There was a time when I rejected comparisons between mass incarceration and slavery or mass incarceration and Jim Crow and believed those kinds of claims and comparisons were exaggerations, were distortions, were hyperbole. In fact, 
There was a time when I thought that people who made those kinds of claims and those kinds of comparisons were actually doing more harm than good to efforts to reform our criminal justice system and achieve greater racial equality in the United States. But after years of working as a civil rights lawyer and advocate representing victims of racial profiling and police brutality and investigating patterns of drug law enforcement in poor communities of color and attempting to assist people who have been released from prison re-enter into a society that had never shown much use for them in the first place, I had a series of experiences that began what I now call my awakening. I began to awaken to a racial reality that is just so obvious to me now that what seems odd in retrospect is that I had managed to be blind to it for so long. And so I am now today so grateful for the people who did not discourage me, but who encouraged me. And my husband in particular, um, stands out among them. I did say in the foreword to my book that he does not share all my views about the criminal justice system. As a federal prosecutor, you can understand his skepticism. Um, but he never once um, doubted um, the mission that I felt that I was on. And he read my chapters over and over, gave me feedback and support, and said, no, you have to say this. You need to speak your truth. And I'm still a little unclear about what exactly he disagrees with, <laughs> if anything. <laughs> and we don't spend a lot of time talking about it over the dinner table. Um, but uh, what's, what, what's so critically important, though, is those people who will stand with you. Um, when you feel that you're standing alone. And um, my husband, my love of my life, has always been that person who has been there for me, uh, even when others um, were more reluctant um, and who suddenly could not be found. And hearing the voices of young people who say this made a difference um, truly makes it all worthwhile. It was my greatest hope and prayer um, that in writing the book that it would help others to have the same kind of awakening that I finally did. I firmly believe that the mass incarceration of poor people of color in the United States is the most pressing racial justice issue of our time. You know, in a 30-year period of time, an incredibly short period of time, our nation's prison population quintupled. Not doubled, not tripled, quintupled. We went from a prison population of about 300,000 to well over 2 million. And this was not due to crime or crime rates. It cannot be explained in such simple terms. Uh, during that 30-year period of time, crime rates fluctuated, went up, went down, went back up again, went back down. And today, as bad as crime rates are in many parts of the country, crime rates are actually at historical lows. But incarceration rates, especially black incarceration rates, have consistently soared. Most criminologists today will acknowledge that crime rates and incarceration rates in the United States have moved independently of one another. Incarceration rates, especially black incarceration rates, have soared regardless of whether crime was going up or going down in any given community or the nation as a whole. So what explains the sudden explosion in incarceration in the United States, the birth of a penal system unprecedented in world history, if not crime and crime rates? Well, the answer is the war on drugs and the get tough movement, the wave of punitiveness that washed over the United States. We now have a system that shuttles young people in ghettoized communities from decrepit, underfunded schools to brand new high-tech prisons. It's a system that traps poor people, overwhelmingly poor people of color, into a permanent second-class status. Because once you're swept in, once you're swept in, no matter how minor of offense, your stop, frisk, search, you're swept in, you're done. 
you're ushered into a parallel social universe in which the very rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement no longer apply to you. Once you're branded a criminal or felon, all those old forms of discrimination that we supposedly left behind, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, denial of the right to vote, exclusion from jury service, are suddenly legal again. You know, as a criminal, you have scarcely more rights and arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. That's why I say we haven't ended racial caste in America, we've just redesigned it. We have spent more than $1 trillion waging the war on drugs since it began in 1982. A trillion dollars. Funds that could have been used for education, funds that could have been used for job creation in the communities that needed it most. A trillion dollars that could have been used for a collective well-being and instead those dollars have been used to pave the way for the destruction of countless lives, families, and dreams. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, I think it begins with moments like this, moments of awakening, where we begin to face the truth about what we as a nation have done again and commit ourselves to ending it. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, a time comes when silence itself is a betrayal. And I believe that time has come. And so I'm grateful for the honor that you've given me because I believe so strongly that by honoring my work, you are honoring the importance of building a movement to end not just mass incarceration, not just the war on drugs, but a movement that will end this history and cycle of caste in America. So thank you so much, I'm very honored. Our final inductee is the Honorable Annie Gutierrez. She received her law degree from the Stanford Law School in 1971. She will be presented by Dr. Francis Morales, Associate Dean and Director of El Centro Chicano. Welcome everyone, and before I start, I just want to acknowledge our past inductees that are here with us, uh, Mr. Beto Juarez and his family. <laughs> and also joining us here, uh, Dr. Elena Rigos. Uh, this afternoon, we had the pleasure of uh, hearing Annie Gutierrez, our inductee. Uh, she spent time in El Centro talking to the students and alumni about the importance of you know, really following uh, the core values in the work that they do. I mean, that's kind of how I saw it, is uh, always follow your core values and don't let, this, don't let um, your education get in the way of your schooling or see the other way around. Don't let your schooling get in the way of your education, see? Okay. But it is my privilege this afternoon to introduce the Honorable Annie M. Gutierrez. Judge Gutierrez received her doctor, her Juris Doctor in 1971 from the Stanford Law School. She was one of, uh, she was one of uh, five students, Latino students who were here that year at the law school. And I believe uh, Annie will tell us more about her story here, her journey at, at Stanford. In 1972, she became the first Spanish surname woman to pass the California bar and soon after, soon after opened up her own law practice in El Centro, California, where she practiced civil and criminal law. Gutierrez was appointed judge at the Superior Court in Imperial County in 2002, becoming the first female judge in the county. Gutierrez is, had previously served as assistant U.S. attorney in El Centro, California from 1995 to 2002 and as Deputy District Attorney in Imperial County in 1995. And before entering Stanford Law School, Judge Gutierrez had already served three and a half years as a lay judge in the Westmoreland Judicial District in Imperial County. And I talked to her about this. Uh, many times, students, when, come, when they come to Stanford, they always feel like they were an affirmative action um, uh, what, uh, student. But with, with Judge Gutierrez coming with three and a half years of previous experience, she was way beyond any level of expectation of students. So thank you for paving that road for us. 
Late judges were permitted in California at this time, provided they pass a test on California law. And Annie had done her studies. She studied all the California code books, the, the legal code books. She credits a CRLA attorney, a California rural legal assistance attorney, who encouraged her to obtain a law degree and even contacted the Stanford Law, law School Dean on her behalf. As a Stanford Law School student and single parent raising a two-year-old daughter, Gutierrez followed her passion for civil rights and justice. Together with other students, she wrote and presented well thought out proposals to Stanford's university president to encourage the recruitment and admission of, Hispani of Hispanics into all areas of the university. Due to these diligent efforts, the number of Chicano and Latino students increased dramatically the following years. Gutierrez's contributions to the legal field and the larger society were vast, are vast and diverse. Between 1995 and 2004, Judge Gutierrez assisted countries in Central and South America and also in Africa in the establishment of jury trials and in the training of attorneys and judges. Gutierrez served as domestic policy advisor to President Carter in 1977 to 1978. When President Kennedy formed the Peace Corps, Gutierrez was among the first people hired. In her professional life, Judge Gutierrez has worked in all the continents except Antarctica and has backtracked alone through China, Tibet, Nepal, and Pakistan. Judge Gutierrez has two children, Angela Marlowe, who teaches children with addictions, and Mark Kokova, a United States Marine. Please join me in congratulating Annie Gutierrez on her induction today to the Multicultural Alumni Hall of Fame. Good afternoon. I, I'm just kind of um, at a loss for words because I don't know what to tell you. Um, there's so much in that little booklet that you've already got you know, that you really don't need to hear anything from me. <laughs> they did a pretty thorough job. Um, I guess I came to Stanford um, quite fortunate. It was very fortunate for me because um, a as a justice court judge, um, I had to pass a test on California law before I could, uh, I could become a, a, a judge. And um, in those days, uh, there... The, the justice court judges were appointed by the Board of Supervisors. And um, what I really wanted to do, what, my, what, was, what was my passion, was to be the, because that's, at the, t that's the time that um, the uh, Economic Opportunities Act came into being, and that's when we were getting, uh, we would get grants to set up programs for self-help housing and to help the rural poor and so on. And so this was where my, my passion was. And so at that job also was up to the Board of Supervisors. And so I went to the Board of Supervisors and, and requested that they hire me. And of course, the Board of Supervisors were all men. <laughs> they were. Everyone was a man in those days. There was no, no, there were no females doing anything of any value, and so, according to them, and so, um, and so, uh, they said no. That was ridiculous. They were, they wouldn't appoint me to the judgeship. Uh, and then um, it turned out that a, a young man that that had worked for the Peace Corps, and I had, I had been, I worked for the Peace Corps. Uh, had um, come, uh, had decided that he needed a job. He was he was ready to move on, and he was an ex uh, an expert in community development and self help housing. So, I asked him if he would be interested, and he said yes. So, um, he went he he then went and to the board of supervisors, and they gave him the job. Of, of the community, so, so then they they had one job left, and that was the judgeship, and so they were pretty much stuck with me because I was the only p person that passed the test. <laughs> so so they had to appoint me. So that's that's how I got into being a judge because I I had no interest in being an attorney in, in any way, shape, or form. But uh, uh, after after being a judge, then I decided I really, really, really wanted to be an attorney. Uh, and because we did we did jury trials in those days, 
in this little tiny town. It was actually Westmoreland, California, and if anybody's ever driven to Arizona and gone through that town, you know that you close your eyes and you don't see it. Um, and so, but we, we were sticking to the books, and they said, you know, you sequester the jury, and so I would have jury trials in that, in that place, and we would sequester them at the Stokely Hotel every night. With the, with the with the constable keeping guard to make sure they didn't communicate outside of the uh, so it was it was looking back it's pretty funny to think that we took it so so very seriously but that's that's what we did so at any rate uh, it it turned out that um, eventually a, a CRLA lawyer California Rural Legal Assistance lawyer came uh, came through uh, the court stopped by said hi, so on, said, what are you doing here? Why don't you go to law school? And I said, I'd love to go to law school, but I, I have a little, I had a little daughter, four years old, my husband had died. And, um, and I said, how am I gonna go to law school? And I, first, I you know, don't have any money, and, and, how, and who's gonna take me, you know? So he, he left, he said, I'm, I'm gonna think about that. And the next thing I know, I got a call from Stanford. And they told, they asked me if I wanted to come, and they said, and and they, I had not applied, I didn't do anything except, except I think send them some transcripts, and that was it. So of course I, I said yes, I, I'll come. But I said I, I need, you know, I I have. I have a child, I have this four-year-old daughter, so I need some housing, you know. Well, oh, don't worry about it. Oh, no, when you get to Stanford, every, well, everything will be fine, the dean said. <laughs> so I ended up uh, packing, packing literally everything I had in that car with my kid and drove to, to Stanford. And we got here, and um, I went to the dean, and he said, Oh well, you're going to be staying with the Barnett family for uh, for a week or a week or two. Barnett was the married to the the daughter of Mattel Toys. They had six kids, and each kid had one, uh, one of everything that Mattel ever made. <laughs> so when I got home, when I got to the to their house, of course, Angela began. Uh, you know, thinking, well, these are my toys, you know, want, wanting all the toys. Uh, their kids were very, very generous and very nice and, and treated her very well, but she was dreaming you know, of all these toys and fearful that somebody would take them away. And so it ended up, she started bedwetting and she started having all these problems. And so I, I went to the, the dean and I said, I, we've got to, I've got to get some housing. You promised that you, he said, look in the, look in the, uh, at want ads. I mean, look in the paper, read the paper, you know, you'll find a job. I mean, a, 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 a place. And I would call and they would say, do, do you have a dog? Uh, and I would say, no, uh, but, but I have a child. Oh no, we don't take children. We don't take children. So I could not get housing. So I went to the dean and I said, this is it. If I'm, I've been with the Barnetts now for, for a couple of weeks. If we don't get housing in Escondido Village, which is this beautiful place that's all surrounded with, uh, you know, with the doors to the outside, so it's a playground in the middle, this wonderful place for children to play, I said, you're next. I'm moving in with you. <laughs> Well, and, and I was serious. The next day, we, we got to go into Escondido Village, and we were the first mother and child to be admitted to Escondido Village. And it was wonderful because it was a, it was a very safe, wonderful place for us to be. Well, the next year, that Stanford decided that they were going to increase the minor the, the minority population because there were there was no there were no minorities let's face it very very few very few at that time but particularly Chicanos there there weren't so they they um, they just well they uh, Luis Nogales and I went around recruiting we were, we recruited all up and down the state. And we talked to kids in all these different schools, seniors, and helped them with their applications and everything. They applied. And we actually got uh, 
I think it was around, uh, close to 100 kids that year, if not 100 little, right around, right around that. And they came from the Central Valley, and they came from places where they were wearing their, their parents or their siblings' hand-me-down clothes. So they were out of style. You know, the pointed shoes were no longer in style for, for the boys, and the, you know, the, hand, the hand-me-down clothes were threadbare, and it was, they, they were a little shabby. And so the Anglo kids really began to make fun of them, and it became a, a real, it became a real problem. So I, I said to them, okay, every, all of you will, first of all, first of all, I, well, I guess the first thing I did was, okay, you're coming to my house every Saturday night. Uh, I will have a, some big hunk of meat of some sort for you to eat, and then you bring a little something because I'd wanted them to feel like they were contributing and to be a part of it, not be afraid to, to come. So they would come with a little little teeny bit of salad or a little jello or wh whatever they could get. And so we, we would sit there and we would, we would plan and think, okay, what, what can we do to make this, make this experience better for you? And, I just, and they all needed money. So I said, okay, we're, we're going to have to get some work-study programs. So I went to the dean and I said, we need some work-study programs for these kids so that they can, they can have a little pocket money and so that they can feel like they can maybe get a new pair of shoes or you know, try to look a little bit more like the average student at Stanford. And so we, we did get... Uh, work study money, and so the work study money was to work in the communities um, of the of the poor uh, Chicano people that lived around the Stanford campus, because there were there were pockets of very 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 poor people, and so we we did all kinds of things to uh, to improve their their lives, and also to do studies and and all kinds of things to to prove that we we needed resources for these areas. Anyway, that worked out very well. The students were very enthusiastic and it worked out very nicely. The only bad thing that happened d uh, during that time was that um, Wally Shiraz's boy, um, uh, who was an astronaut in, those, in the good old days, um, and got into a fight with a Chicano kid. And the, the Chicano kid um, apparently um, hit him uh, hard and so the Chicano kid was expelled, and so it was it was um, it was a real bad situation at that time. <clears throat> that I can proudly tell you now that that Chicano kid has since come back to Stanford and graduated with a law degree now, and he's been practicing law for several years. So it all turned out well, but it was it was very trying at that time. That was a very very trying time. Um, so there were a lot of ups and downs, and it was it was not easy. It was uh, it was very hard to get these minority kids integrated into the school. Um, now, when I look when I see the campus and I and I see all of the people here uh, 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 working together so well, and I see that the students aren't making any kind of distinction between the other students. The, there are Asian students, there are Hispanic students, there are black students. Everybody is getting along. Everybody seems to uh, understand that they each have their own culture, and it's just so wonderful. I would not have thought that this would be possible in those days. Because I mean, in those days, I could not, vi I could not envision that there would be such a wonderful uh, turnout. Uh, at Stanford, that Stanford would turn around and really, really open its doors and and somehow manage to get all of these wonderful students together and give them a good education and and um, it it just it just break it just makes my heart 
you know, want to sing because uh, I, I haven't been coming back and forth to Stanford. So I, I come very, this is a, a long time since I've been here. And it, it, to me, it's just a whole new world. It's wonderful. I so much, I so much uh, appreciate what's going on here now. So um, I don't, I don't know um, what more I can tell you. I mean, there's, my resume is in there. You can look at the resume. I, uh, I'm, I had, I've had a great life. I can tell you that much. Um, I, I, I worked. Uh, I worked at the White House probably for Carter, probably a little more than that year that's down there. I, I think it was close to two years. Um, I, I felt, you know, he was he was a nice man, but he was not a very good president. And uh, you know, he he you have advisors when you're president, and you you know, you mine was area of justice and civil rights. And um, we would, you know, write uh, all kinds of, of paper to, to, to whenever there was an issue uh, or, you know, whatever. And um, I don't think he ever read them. Or if he did, <laughs> I don't know. He was a nice man. He meant well. You know, the things that the things that Carter has done since he left the White House, I, I think, are absolutely fantastic. I mean, the, this whole Habitat for Humanity, all of that is just. Outstanding, but the but the man he he meant well, but it, it, it just it just didn't work out, and you know he, he was he was very emotional, <laughs> he was very emotional man. the the day the last day that I was at the White House, that was the day that the hostages were taken in, uh, you know over there, <laughs> um, and. There's a bubble room in the White House. It's literally a bubble, and it, it's, the, it's the safest, um, most secret room in the White House. And so <clears throat> the, uh, it, 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 clearly there was a problem. I didn't, I didn't really realize at that time because they were getting it uh, real time. Um, and, then I, and then I saw that it was that the hostages had been taken, and so um, President Carter went in there to into the bubble room, and he and he started looking because they have TV con connections, and they could see be seeing what was going on. And um, the man came out of the room, crying, crying like a baby. I mean, he was sobbing. The man was sobbing as he walked out of that station, situation room because he saw that the plant, he saw the crash, he saw. You know that the hostages were taken, and it was, it was, um, it was in many ways to me um, clear that this man should not be president. Perhaps um, he he was so emotional that I don't know how he could make a rational decision at, at that at that time. He it was he was so emotional. Um, he was he was a, a much he, he's done a lot of great things since then. The other thing about President Carter, that really, really ticked me off, was, uh, uh, is it time to go? Okay, well, one, see, what, one, one more, one more, one more, one more tale. Uh, he, he, he went to Mexico City, because uh, I, because I was, after I left, I, I don't know if it was before or after the administration, I think it was after I left the administration, I went to Mexico City, that's what happened. After, the, after I left the Carter office, I, uh, I went to Mexico City and I was in charge of, of um, the, our relations with Mexico. And I was at the embassy. And <laughs> President Carter came to Mexico and there was this huge banquet that the President of Mexico gave for him. Was, and it was really the high, you know, the high upper crust, all, all of the legislature, every, everybody was there. And Carter gets up and, and because the Mexican president gave a toast and then Carter gets up and he tries to make a joke. You know, nobody, I mean, never occurred to us that he was going to make a joke. We had talking points. We thought that they would be followed. We didn't expect this to happen. But he gets up and he says, well, he says, you know what, I just... I came to Mexico, and now I got Montezuma's revenge. And, oh, my gosh. I mean, that, that was the most embarrassing. I mean, every, 
I, I couldn't believe it. This man, this is the president of the United States. Oh my gosh. You know, so I thought, I, I'm going to, I, I'm getting out of this one, you know. I, 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 so anyway, I, I won't keep you any longer because I know you're pressed for time. But um, I, I want to thank Stanford very much for honoring me. It, it, it's, uh, it's been a, a, a great um, pleasure to be here today and to meet all of the people that I've met and to be back on the old campus. I can tell you that it's changed so much that I would not recognize it if I hadn't have been uh, uh, taken almost by the hand around all of these massive buildings that have now appeared. So it, it's, I really appreciate it. I think Stanford is on its way. It's done, it's done more than I could imagine. And um, I appreciate your coming here. And I thank you all very much for the opportunity to be here with you. Thank you. I would like to introduce Marisa Brutoko St. Meyer to bring us closing remarks. She is a member of the class of 2000, received her law degree from the Stanford Law School in 2004, and a member of the board of directors of the Stanford Alumni Association, of the board of visitors of the Stanford Law School, and the ex officio member of the board of governors of the Stanford Associates. And she will close the program this evening. Thank you. So. That's a hard act to follow. So, um, and I have the dubious honor of standing between you and dessert, so I'll make this very brief. Um, it's with great cardinal pride that I celebrate with you today. This annual event gives us the opportunity to celebrate with our communities, to come together, and to honor the accomplishments of diverse alumni leaders. We congratulate each of our leaders here on your achievements. And um, it's truly inspiring to see. Um, as evidenced here today, the ties that bind us to Stanford, including the law school, to each other, and to our communities are strong. Um, and I'm sure it's inspiring to the students as it is to me and each of us here. Um, on behalf of all the alumni and our friends gathered here, I want to thank the selection committees, the directors of the centers, um, the staff of those centers, and uh, all of those at Stanford Alumni Association for making this possible. It was truly a wonderful event. And please continue and um, enjoy and celebrate with dessert. And you can catch this on Stanford iTunes next month. Thanks very much.